your Bibles, go ahead and open them back up to 1 Thessalonians. And we're going to be skimming 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. I think it's interesting that these two books say pretty much the same thing. And I wonder, when I'm reading them, why Paul had to write the same thing to the same church twice. But really, when you read the two Corinthians, it's kind of the same thing. He tells them, you need to be better. First letter, he starts talking to the They're writing this letter together. The second letter will be so. Timothy, all much longer than very short. They're very to the point. And that's what I love about them because he doesn't beat around the bush about what he is wanting the church to be, who he wants them to be, and what he wants them to look forward to. He starts by thanking them for being such amazing Christians, for shunning the ways of the world and turning to virtue, turning to the life that sets us apart from the world. He says in chapter 1, verse 9, that they tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus. It's really amazing to me that half of this book is about how we live, how we live in Christ. He talks about the example that they lived as a church because he says, just as in chapter 2, verse 7, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked day and night in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. They have received the gospel so fully, so wholeheartedly, that Paul wants to make sure that nothing stands between them and living the gospel, because he wants to make sure that this church grows. They they found it, they got it, they know what it is that they're holding on to, and Paul is making sure that they have ever. And the Thessalonian church is not a large church. Thessalonica was not a large city, not by today's standards. Even Corinth, the bustling hub that it was, was 1,500 people. That was a big city. 1,500 people lived there. This was not a big church. And Paul is making sure that he is not a burden to them, that there is nothing standing between them and living the gospel. Because he knows there's just a few people in the pews, and they have to make everything count. And as a church, and everything else has to come in and help with that. It all has to be dedicated to that because we don't have a lot. Neither did this church. He tells them about the shining report that he gets from Timothy. You see, Paul keeps sending people to Thessalonica. He keeps sending people to this church because he keeps telling missionaries, this is what you want your church to be like. This, when you go off to other cities to spread the gospel, this is the kind of church that you want to be planting. He wants them to go to Thessalonica first and see the church that's doing it right. And then take what they learn there and go to other cities and spread the word. Because it's not enough that Thessalonica got it right. Paul wants to see the gospel spread to all the corners of the world. He writes to the Romans how much he is looking forward to going to Spain. We don't know that he ever got there. He talks about going all the way to Spain. There's a legend that Timothy, 
Timothy, not Timothy, uh, Thomas, the apostle, who said, unless I see his wounds and touch his side, I will not believe that he has risen from the dead. Timothy went all the way to India. There's a church there in India, and it's pretty far to the east, but it's still in India. And they claim the gospel had spread in one lifetime. The Thessalonians were the model of that early church. And when Paul sees this, he sends missionary after missionary to them. See this church, see how they're living, and then take that message with you. When I go to the churches of Christ, when I go to the singings, and I see how they're living, how they're preaching, what... It is in what ways we are like them, in what ways we are not like them, because our churches are not alike. That's not what we're, that's not what binds us together as churches of Christ. I love seeing what the Spirit is doing in the other corners of the Central Valley. We're doing, oh yeah. What is a common denominator that you, you come away from it when you go to these churches? You say you can see what things they're doing right and mm -hmm. some things that they're not doing. Sometimes, and I have the tendency to focus on the technical. I will say that that, that is very much my weakness. And sometimes I see churches that are shunning technology the way that we're embracing it. Sometimes I see churches that are very much going all in on technology, and they no longer have Bibles in the pews. Sometimes I see churches that have been doing the same thing they've been doing since 1950. But their message has changed. If I don't know of one Church of Christ that is still preaching the same message that they, they were preaching 10, 15, 20 years ago, let alone the message that they were preaching in 1950, though a lot of them still have the same tracts that they were printing in 1950, which always surprises me. I think those must be someone's favorites. <laughs> <laughs> but I see the way that the churches are changing and evolving, and they're addressing the perspectives that new members are bringing in. And I can't help but wonder how we might address these new perspectives because we are a new church and I'm probably one of the few people that grew up in the Church of Christ here. And so there's not a lot of that culture from those other churches in the Valley that we have, that we haven't developed from, from day one. But the ways that I see their churches addressing the ideas that new people are bringing in are things that we're embracing here. And the things that I see that the, the welding on to their traditions are things that I never, they still use hymnals at these other churches. And we don't have them. We're never going to get them either because it's cheaper to do PowerPoints and hymnals. We're never going to get them either because it's cheaper to do PowerPoints than hymnals. So that's interesting to me because I was not a part of Church of Christ for about 10 years. And it just feels like everything has changed. But even if you weren't, if you didn't grow up in the Church of Christ, if you grew up in any other denomination, things have changed. And Paul is very much talking to the Thessalonians about inevitability. You're getting it right, Thessalonians. You are. You're doing what the Lord wants you to do. And it's not until verse 13 that he talks about what is coming. He says to them, 
Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. Now, you know we talk about heaven. You know we talk about the afterlife and the day of resurrection. And in Paul's day, these were all very new and different ideas. And he's talking to Christians in Thessalonica, in Greece. Well, they don't have any idea what the day of the Lord is. They don't know about the day of resurrection. To them, there's Hades. There's an afterlife, but not everyone gets resurrected. Only the gods live forever in the body. Everyone else lives as disembodied spirit in the realm of the dead. And so he meets them halfway when he talks about this. And he talks about it so that they expect the day of the Lord. They expect resurrection. And so he's talking about their experience. They expect heaven. And he's saying, but really... We're hoping for resurrection, not just heaven. And he starts here, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of humanity who have no hope. Why do they have no hope? Because they're Greek. To them, death is eternal slumber. It's disembodied. And by the way, all of your feeling, everything good and bad, everything you feel and want and desire, that is all because of you. They have no hope. He goes on for we believe Mount Olympus. And those of us know. I'm backwards again. <laughs> I keep doing this. See, here's the thing. If you're expecting a rapture experience, buy a back to front. Oh. So I keep getting it wrong. Because the Bible doesn't say that we will be raptured. It actually says the dead will rise first. So they're going to rise up and be standing here next to us when Christ comes. After that, we who are still alive and are left, what does he mean, and are left? In another book, he, he compares this to the days of Noah. And he says that those who were in the world were washed away by the flood and Noah's family was left. Noah's family was what was left. And so he says that after that, we who are still alive and are left, who remain after the wicked have been washed away, will be caught up together with them in the clouds. And I love this image because there is, there is no hierarchy here. God isn't picking favorites because you're not God's favorite because you happen to be born in the time when Christ returns. The dead rise first, and we all go together. Just as Paul's been telling them throughout this book that life as, a, as Christians means life as a community, as a family. We are all one. We are all together, and God does not play favorites. First the dead rise, and then we all go home together. No one goes home first, still, but as someone who sat in a pew for literal decades, I will say that as a teenager, you start thinking, yeah, Jesus is returning any time now. That makes sense. You haven't lived very long. You haven't been to church for very long. And the older you get, the more you think, wow, any time now is really taking quite some time, isn't it? Well, imagine being the Thessalonians. If we think that Christ coming back is a one-time event, then the Thessalonians never saw it. That's Paul telling them, it's any day now. Why would he tell us, be prepared, it's coming any day now? Throughout this book, 
they're his example for other churches. <laughs> Keep living the way you're living. He tells them, for you know that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But brothers and sisters, but brothers and sisters are not in darkness, so that this day should not surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. 